guys, thank you for being part of a life group. I'm really excited as we kick off this new series, Rediscover, and uh, man, it's going to be a blast. You know, this, this series was born out of this idea that, you know, here we are in the South, and so many people have heard about Jesus. They've even had some sort of church experience to some degree, uh, but yet the majority, the vast majority of people aren't involved in the local church and are not followers of Jesus. And so I've had this conversation many times with friends, uh, other pastors and, and ministry leaders, and uh, just the importance of we uh, believe one of our greatest responsibilities in the place that we are in the, in the country, the place that we are in, in, in our time in history, is helping people rediscover who Jesus really is and helping people rediscover what it truly means to be a Christ follower and be in the church. Because we've been sold uh, much different ideas in the church. We've been so desperate just to get people uh, you know, to pray some prayer or twist their arm into not going to hell, that yet we've missed the essence of oftentimes of what it means to actually follow Jesus, who Jesus really is and what it means to be part of his church and to follow him. So that's where this uh, series came from. And today, we're going to be talking about who is Jesus. Uh, I mean, have you ever asked yourself this question? What is the big deal with Jesus? I mean, why did Jesus have to come to earth? You know, I used to ask myself this question uh, before I was uh, a Christ follower. Of course, I knew uh, about Jesus. I'd heard people talk about Jesus. I grew up in Mississippi, so it wasn't like I'd never heard the name Christ or Jesus uh, but my question was always, I mean, why couldn't God just get over it? I mean, you know, if he's God and we've sinned and we're going to hell, then why couldn't God just go, your sins are forgiven, it's okay, I'm over it, I'm God, I can do whatever I want. Well, after I became a Christ follower and realized my need for God, I began to explore what the scripture says and explore uh, what God has to say and the reason that God obviously couldn't just say, poof, your sins are forgiven, no worries, uh, is because God is described in the scripture as holy. What that means is God is other. God is perfect. He's beyond what we can comprehend or understand in his perfection and in his holiness. And we as humans have sinned. And because we've sinned, we've been separated from God. See, the separation from God is because of our sin and because God is holy and other, he can't be in relationship with people who are in sin. He can't be in relationship with people who are broken. The Bible describes as our absolute best is as filthy rags before God. You see, we are broken people and we are in need of rescue. But here's the amazing thing about God. Even though God doesn't just go, poof, everybody's sins are forgiven. I'm God, I can do what I want to do. The Bible says that God so loved the world, God so loved you and so loved me and everyone else from every nation, every color, every place, every person. He loved all people that he sent his son Jesus on the rescue mission to make right the relationship that had been broken. Now, God didn't have to do that, but God loves us. He loves you. He wants us to be in relationship with him, to be in the relationship we were created for. And that is in relationship with God. But the only way that can happen is if our sins are forgiven. And God sent Jesus on this rescue mission. I wanna read Romans 3, 19 through 26 as we really wrestle through this question. What's, what's the big deal with Jesus? Romans 3, 19 through uh, 26 say this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. You see, we're all accountable to God for our sins. Every person will be held accountable for their sins. And then he goes on in verse 20, he says, because we're all held accountable, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight, talking about nobody will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. You see, in the Old Testament, we have the law, and, 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 and you had to keep the law perfectly to be made right with God. But it's obvious throughout the whole Testament that there's never been a person outside of Jesus Christ himself who kept the law perfectly. 
And then he goes on, he says, rather, through the law, we become conscious of, conscious of sin. We recognize our need for rescue. You see, the Old Testament reveals to me and you that we are messed up and that we can't do enough to get right with God. We can't do enough to get back to the relationship that God created for us to be in, that God made us for. And then he goes on in verse 20, he says, but even though we can't be made right through keeping the law, now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and prophets testify. You see, the crazy thing is we can't keep the law to be made right with God, but yet the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, they prophesy, they speak of this one who is to come who will make us right. They speak of the one who is to come who will be the Messiah, the one who will bring us back into relationship with God. He goes on in verse 22 and he says, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. You see, the righteousness of God, it comes through. When God so loved the world that he sent his only son, it is through his son that we can be made righteous, that we can be made right with God. And then he goes on, it's to all who believe. He says, there is no difference now, that's an important statement because he's saying, listen, it doesn't matter whether you're from Jerusalem or whether you're from Alabama. There is no difference. We're all equal. We all need God. No one will be made right based on what they do, where they're from, or the color of their skin. All people need God. All people need the forgiveness of Christ. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And are justified freely. Justified is a legal term that means be made right. Being brought back into that relationship. They are justified freely by his grace. Check this out. Through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. You see the redemption came by Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ kept the law that we couldn't keep. He lived the sinless life that we couldn't live. And when we come to that point and realization that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory and there's no way that I can be in the relationship with my creator based on anything I can do and I need to be rescued. When we come to that point of, of, of understanding and we call out on the name of Jesus, the perfect sinless life of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is applied then to our lives and now we are called righteous by faith. That's exactly what he said, that righteousness only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. He goes on and he said in verse 25, God presented him, talking about Jesus, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement. You see, there had to be a sacrifice made for my sin and your sin, a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. The blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross was the perfect sacrifice offered to God the Father for the wrath of my sin and your sin. It says he did this, God did this to demonstrate his justice. You see, God can't let sin go unjudged. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, check this out, so as to, um, so, as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. You see, Jesus came to justify us. He came so that we could be made right with God. He came to bring us back into the relationship that we were created for. When it talks about this blood atonement, this sacrifice that was made, he's pointing back to the Old Testament, the temple. You see, in the temple, the people of, of Israel would, would bring their sacrifices, and one time a year, the high priest would enter into what was known in the temple as the Holy of Holies, and he would make a sacrifice for the people of God. But here's the problem. The sacrifice that was made by that unblemished animal would only be temporary. It would fade, and the people of God would turn back to their wickedness to their own way. But yet, Jesus was the sinless son of God. 
And when his blood was shed, he made a sacrifice that would be eternal. The eternal sacrifice for my sin and your sin. And the scripture describes that when Jesus was on the cross that, that he, he yelled out and the veil was torn. You see, there was a veil, there was a curtain in essence that separated the holy of holies, the, the ark of the covenant where God's presence dwelled on earth and humanity. And only the high priest would go in once a year. And he may not come out alive. He would only go in once a year, but yet Jesus makes this perfect sacrifice and he enters in to the presence of God the Father and opens up access for me and you. The veil is torn, access is opened. We now can enter into the presence of God. And Hebrews, check out what this says. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, that's talking about the holy of holies in the temple, by the blood of Jesus. You see, things have changed. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We are separated from God, but because of Jesus Christ and our faith in him and what he's done, we now have confidence to enter the holy of holies. If someone entered the holy of holies, the most holy place, they would immediately die in the presence of God because they are wicked sinners. And God cannot be in relationship with sin. Death would, would take place. But yet, because of Jesus' sacrifice applied to me and you, we now can enter the holy of holies, the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, only by the blood of Jesus. It says, by a new and living way, open, opened for us through the curtain, through the veil. It's been opened through the veil that separated man and God. That has been removed by Christ. That is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, he says, let us draw near to God. We can come near to God. How amazing is this? With sincere, with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. If you remember what I said a minute ago in Romans, it says that the Old Testament was there to reveal to us that we had sin. And now Jesus has come to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. He's come to cleanse us from the weight of that sin, the penalty of that sin, having our bodies washed with pure water. And he says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for we, for he who promised is faithful. You see, God is faithful. He has removed the barriers for us to know him. That is the big deal of Jesus. That is why Jesus came. So here's what I want you to do. In your group, I want you to begin to discuss and celebrate and give thanks for how awesome it is that God so loved you and God so loved me that he sent his son to make a way, to open up the most holy place for us to be brought back into relationship with God. Thanks so much.